chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, and you say, Proverbs, yeah, it'll be a little different this evening. And yeah, we're getting ready to begin series on Wednesday evening, and we'll be uh, doing uh, more expository through the Scripture. But this evening I just had a message that kind of has to do with uh, some of our theme for this year. And our theme this year is Rejoicing with Great Joy. How many of you have been studying that theme? How many of you have made that a personal study? Uh, just looking at the phrase in the Bible in different contexts, rejoicing, joy, and just rejoice in its cognizance. You'd be surprised. You'd be, I think, greatly helped at uh, each context. One of the things that, that I've seen in those contexts is that believers that are rejoicing with great joy are doing so after they have done something for the Lord. And, you know, a good example would be at Christmas time, as we remember the wise men, and uh, they, after they returned, rejoicing with great joy. And uh, there are many uh, other other instances, of course, we looked at uh, when they were getting ready to build the, uh, the tabernacle, and when the people brought and gave, and they had to tell them no more, but the people that were giving came, and they were giving, and they were rejoicing with great joy. And one of the reminders, I just, you know, I'm a happy guy. I like to be happy. I, I uh, don't have a whole lot of tolerance for unhappiness, to be quite frank with you. Happiness, ir unhappiness irritates me. I, just, I don't see why any person has anything to be unhappy about. And uh, I just, it just gets, it grates me. Nothing grates me more quickly uh, than unhappiness. And nothing makes me unhappy more quickly <laughs> than unhappiness. But, you know, I want to rejoice in life. And I'm not, not fake, not pretend, you know, this is how to be positive. And we're not talking about some philosophical or uh, some way to feel happy. I'm talking about having joy. Having joy and, and feeling blessed and feeling happy. And one of the things that we're going to see this year is that there are things that we have to do if that's the way we want to feel. I'd love to end 2019 and be able to say two things. It's the best year I've ever lived. I'd love for 2019 to end that way. It's the best year I've ever lived. And it's the best year of my life. And I've seen God do more than I've ever seen before. And then I'd like to say, you know what? I've just never been happier. I think this would be a great, be a great year. You say, well, Pastor, what needs to happen for that to, to happen? Well, all the things that have to do with believers, what they do in order to rejoice. But you know, it's really our choice. Really, things that we can do if we understand it. So, I would encourage you uh, to to make it a personal study and say, "Well, how can I rejoice with great joy?" All right, are you in Proverbs chapter thirty? Yes, sir. I think I'm going to keep stalling, and more people will come in. It's been a trickle effect <laughs> all evening. All right, Proverbs chapter thirty, and would you please look down with me? I'd actually like to cover several contexts here, but this evening we won't. I just like a really simple message. Uh, look down to verse twenty-four, and and I want to read about the, the four things that are little upon the earth but are exceeding wise. Okay, so let's begin. Verse 24. There be... So you know this lady who wrote this is from the hood. Is the way she said this. Uh, there be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Uh, the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rock. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands as in, and is in king's palaces. And then let's read uh, the verses 29 and, the, and, the, the, uh, and 31, through 31. There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely and going. A lion which is strongest among, among beasts and turneth not away for any. A greyhound, and he goat also, and a cane against whom there is no rising up. Well, let's, let's stop there. And we may not make it past verse 28 this evening uh, for sake of time, but let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. God, please help us tonight as we look at the Scripture and we just see some very, very simple truths God, help us not to be like those that see and understand and yet uh, don't do what we see and what we understand. I pray that you help us to be wise and that we would see the truths in this Scripture and we would adopt them. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you read a proverb a day? How many here you do a proverb? Several people here do a proverb every single day. Isn't that great? They're reading a proverb a day. When I was in um, first and second grade, 
I, I had the misfortune of going to a Christian school <laughs> of whom the teacher was my mother. And she made me memorize Proverbs, the, the book of Proverbs. And I used to be able to, years ago, I used to be able to quote chapters 1 through 31. Can't do it anymore. I can start off the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to give subtly to the simple. But anyway, I, but I could go from chapter 1 to verse 31. And if you had my mom, you'd have been able to do it too. I promise you. Uh, she, she was a great encourager. <laughs> making you learn how to do things and uh, so anyway uh, but you know it, that was I, I'll be honest with you I'm not sure that you could help a child much more than putting the scripture and particularly Proverbs in their heart have you noticed in Proverbs you know the, the scripture talks about the wise the simple and uh, the scorner and those particular categories also the foolish I uh, address as those individuals. And, you know, I don't know what age it was when I realized that Solomon, who wrote most of Proverbs, was pretty much I know, he, one of the not wise categories most of his life, or a lot of his life. In other words, a lot of people, you know, we talk about Solomon as the wisest man who ever lived, and God did give him great wisdom. But Solomon asked God to give him an understanding heart so that he could rule the people well. Remember that? And uh, that was what he asked God for. And God just gave him everything. You know, the tragedy of Solomon is how he ended. It just didn't end well. And I can just imagine Solomon being the kind of father that would say, do as I say, not as I do. Uh. Now, that's one of the worst things in the world in our minds. But I'll be honest with you. I'm not so down on a guy that will at least admit he's wrong about something and say, don't be like me. And that really, I think, is a lot of the perspective of most of the Proverbs. Now, obviously, this chapter, verse 30, is written by Agur, the, uh, the uh, son of, let's, what is it, the uh, son of Jacob, even the prophecy of the man. So, um, this is not, this one in particular is not written by Solomon. But all that rambling was to get to the place where I want to say this. You know, there really are two types of people when it comes to learning in life, aren't there? There are people who learn by listening and, and, and just taking the information and acting on good information. And then there are those that learn uh, by um, what we call the school of hard knocks. You know, the, they learn because they try and do it the wrong way, and then it, they go so badly for them that they try it again, and then it goes so badly that they try it again. And then after so many times, they finally realize, this is never going to work, and I'm just going to have to do it the right way. And then they, that's how they learn. And... I, I have a lot of friends that tell me that's my model, that's how I do it, that's how I learn. My goal as, as a believer has always been to hear words of wisdom and to listen to wisdom. Now, I'm not trying to tell you I'm a wise person. Uh, I'm not trying to set myself up as an example or anything like that. But, you know, there are a lot of things that wise people taught me when I was a young person that I listened to and that have really stood me in good stead in my life. I did have the benefit of being a first-generation Christian. Going, to, like I mentioned before, to Christian school all my life, and I had some really fantastic teachers. In particular, our, uh, my high school principal was just a godly man. One of the things he modeled better than anything else was a relationship with his wife. A man loved his wife. And he, was, he just he had a relationship that everybody wanted to have. And he used to talk to us when we were in high school he used to talk to us in math class, algebra class, advanced math, calculus, that sort of thing. He would talk to us about relationships and dating. And he'd say, you don't have any business dating unless you're going to marry a girl. So I'd just say, okay, don't have any business dating unless I'm going to marry a girl. You know, that was a pretty good bit of help. He said, you don't need to date until you're in college. And you don't date until you're junior. Well, that was bad advice. I started dating and uh, just because I was old enough. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he said, you know, don't ever kiss a girl before you're married. And you know, the first, the first girl I ever kissed is my wife on our wedding day. And, uh, you know, that was weird when I was a kid. You were a weirdo for being like that and doing it. And I don't think any of the other Christian school kids that I went to school with uh, listened to that bit of advice, but it stood me in good stead. And I'll tell you, it was a big, big help in my life. It's helped my marriage a great deal. And uh, seriously, it has. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of good has come from that. And, uh, you know, all it was was just listening. Well, you know what? You said do this and listen. Talked a bit there. He used to talk about going to Christian college, about debt. Learned a lot about finances from uh, just, just having a wise Christian man who didn't make very much money but was really, really wise with what he did with his money. 
and uh, it taught me a lot. And there's just so many folks that have so many problems with relationships and finances and all these things that, you know, if they just go to the Word of God and look at it, they could learn. And that's what Proverbs is really all about. Proverbs is all about this is what you do so that you don't mess up and you don't have problems. And it's, it's just a real help. It's helped me today. Well, this passage of Scripture that we're in this evening is a good... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I better not make a millennial joke here. I haven't, I haven't picked on millennials in a long time, have I? It's been, has it been months? It's been a you know, lot. Month, yeah, it's been, it's a been, lot. been a long time. I'm sorry, millennials. You know, we lost a lot of our millennials, didn't we? They're gone. I, I quit picking on them and they went away. <laughs> so, <laughs> we've only got a few of them here this evening. But um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that one of the things that's really tough for me is the millennials... Uh, the millennial mindset, but they, they're, they're a pretty smart generation in some ways. There are some things about millennials that uh, I don't, I just don't relate to, but that, you know, there are some things they do that they handle themselves uh, pretty wisely. But I, I look at verse 25, and uh, really, uh, actually, the verse 27, that's the millennials in my opinion, okay? But uh, let's, we'll get there in just a minute. For, uh, verse 25, I just want to look at these people groups and their effectiveness, the, these individuals. <laughs> That, uh, that do things that really are greater than they are. You ever feel like the, that the task which God has entrusted you to is greater than your ability? Of course it is. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Just stop there and reflect on that sometime and you'll realize that's too big for me. I can't do that. That's a generational... Uh, generational responsibility. It's not a one-time responsibility. Every generation is supposed to teach all nations. And I'll tell you something, every time I try to just cover a few miles around the church and encounter every person possible, I realize how small I am and how powerless I am, how ineffective. Well, look at verse 25. The Bible says, The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. And Melissa, I didn't preach this tonight just because of our backyard right now. The ants have overtaken our well, not just our backyard, our backyard, our front yard. They are absolutely everywhere. And about uh, every two days, they organize and, and uh, come into the house. I'm serious, like a, like a, like a, just a parade of them. You know, it's almost like they're beating drums or something. They're like, here they come. And we look at the door and, oh, no. And there's a thick line of ants coming into the house. And I stand there and smash them with my foot. And I've got some bifenthrin I need to spray. Remind me to bring the sprayer home tonight. Uh, I might brought my sprayer to the church. I haven't been able to spray the ants, but they are just really, really bad right now. Uh, it's not hard to kill an ant. Even if they were resistant to every uh, pesticide in the world, they're not resistant to squishing them <laughs> under your foot and uh, smashing them. And the point is, is that, you know, I mean, obviously there's some ants that would terrorize some of y'all, but that's because you're millennials. Uh, <laughs> okay, there's two for tonight. Uh, there's some ants that would terrify some people. You know, fire ants can be pretty terrible. They, they, those things start crawling on you and biting. You're in a lot of trouble. They'll make you move in a hurry. How many times I've stepped out of a vehicle in sandals at nighttime and felt something, you know, the, the earth kind of give under my feet and not think much about it until all of a sudden they're on fire. And man, them things, they will really, really get you. Uh, but the fact is, is that a fire ant isn't strong in the sense that it can't be killed. Man, you can squish it with your thumb, with your finger. But the Bible says they're not strong, but they make their, they prepare their meat in the summer. How does an ant ever survive a winter? Well, obviously in Florida it's not much of a problem. But uh, <laughs> I guess that's my, why we have more of them. But the fact is, is that they prepare themselves. In other words, they get together, they work together, and they prepare themselves. And they accomplish some pretty incredible things. You know, we talk, you know, I've watched videos of ants, and I've watched ants in personally. I'm pretty fascinated by them. I've watched them through a magnifying glass until they popped and burn up. And, uh, <laughs> that's not a nice thing to say. Is, but I've watched ants, you know, observed them carrying things much larger than they are. But the strength of the ant isn't in its, in its power-to-weight ratio, which is impressive. The strength of the ant is in their colonization. The way that they work together and they can build a colony and they take care of their they take care of each other and they plan and they do things and they work together well. You know, if we're going to be a, a 
just just a, a wise people. One of the things that we ought to do is be is to be people that are like ants in the sense that we prepare for things. We make preparations. I, you know, it's not just a good statement. It's really true. The old aim at nothing and you'll hit it uh, statement. That really is a, is a fact. Sometimes I look at our calendar and I just think, who in the world is scheduling all this? This is going to kill us. you know. But then you look back over a year's time and, and the year goes by and a lot of times you ask, did we do anything? And you look back and you start just looking at the events of the calendar and everything that happened each time and people that got saved and people that were reached and you realize, yes, you know what? They, you aim at something and you do hit something. You do accomplish some things. And uh, the way to do that is as a body of believers, as a church, to be part, be plugged in. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just amazing if you ever watch ants and watch them all scrambling around with their little fingers doing their sign language thing and, and uh, they're doing their, their little filler thing and one of them goes out and they, they, they all go out and they'll stand, sit in a little, little bunch and they'll kind of all be sitting there wiggling around while a couple of them take off different directions. And then all of a sudden one of them finds food and comes back and goes like this. And the next thing you know, there's a thousand ants. Just, I mean, they're working together. They have, they have their scouts. They, they, they're incredible, incredibly intelligent, incredibly effective. And you ever just think about the mounds that they make and the piles of sand that they make and the way that they work and they, the, the way that they work together. An ant never works alone. You see one ant, you're in a lot of trouble because there are a lot more. So you squish one, but they'll keep coming. Has anyone ever squished down an entire ant hill before? Ever, 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 you have, you guys have. Maybe when I was younger. You're the guys they made that movie about, aren't you? <laughs> Ant movie. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. That I, I've never gotten to watch it, but I, my dad told me about it. Uh, he really <laughs> did too. <laughs> All right, let's move on. The conies. The conies, and these are uh, supposed to be. You know, we're we're not actually sure that we know exactly the kind of an animal that the conies were, but they they are supposedly a, a very very soft. A feeble creature, but they, where where they burrow into on the side of a cliff, they are in a protected place. And uh, the illustration here about the four things on the earth that are really little, not impressive, but are wise, are the conies. And you know, it's not difficult to understand the application that Solomon wants the wise man to get from this. Because here you have a little critter who's tasty and easy to eat. Uh, but you can't get at him. In other words, he's in a place, he makes his home, and they make their houses in the rocks. And so they put themselves in a place of protection. In other words, they know what their weakness is. You know, a lot of believers, we don't think we have any weaknesses. We don't think we have any vulnerabilities, and so we just we, we put ourselves out in some dangerous places. It, it is absolutely heartbreaking to me to watch young people who are uh, out of fellowship with the Lord, and they're, they're trying to get in the world and they think they got the world by its tail. You know, and you just think, man, they're going to just absolutely be destroyed. I can write the story of a rebellious young girl. I can write the story of a rebellious young boy. It's not anything new. Every young person that is living, uh, living for, the, for the world, living in the world, uh, they think they're going to be the first person to do everything the wrong way and have a good outcome. But there's never been that person. No person's ever played with sin, and had good results. It's never happened. The conies are a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. You know, but there are just things that believers ought to have enough humility to do. And that, those things they ought to have enough humility to do are to go to places of walled-up protection. You know, you ought to, as a believer, realize there's no one in the world exactly like you. There's no one in the world that has the same vulnerabilities that you have. Sometimes you look at somebody and their vulnerabilities, you think, <laughs> I can't believe that. You know, I can't believe you know he or she is susceptible to that. Like, really, that's a struggle for you, not a struggle for me. Well, obviously not. We're not the same person. There are things you ought to do, you ought to have. Uh, there are believers who shouldn't have media. They just shouldn't have media. They ought to have a flip phone instead of a smartphone. Um, they ought to have. Uh, they shouldn't have internet at their house. Uh, you know, you, we used to talk about television, but really, you know, if you've got a if you've got a smartphone, there's really nothing on television that doesn't can't be come through that, and much more, as well. And there are believers that just ought to just say, you know what, I can't have, I can't have that in my house. 
that you say, Pastor, that's not my problem. Well, it must not be your problem. But there are people that do. I remember when I was in high school struggling with things I listened to and uh, actually taking the stereo out of my truck for a while. Just took it out. Just took it out of there. Thought, well, I'll never listen to it if it's not there. Bill Walsh. Make your house in a rock. Go to a safe place and be there. There are believers who shouldn't be alone. You, you just you, you and your mind and all the people that are in it uh, are just not good company. And you need to be in fellowship with believers. And you just ought to be that, that pesky person and say, what are you all doing tonight? Can I come over? And you ought to just be in a safe place. You ought to be around people that want to do right and put yourself in the kind of fellowship with people that are serving the Lord and just you know, realize I can't be around those kind of friends. Every time I'm around those people, then I get destroyed. Whatever the situation is, whatever the matter is, the Coneys are feeble folk, yet make their, their houses in the rocks. And the implication here is that these small, vulnerable animals who could easily be destroyed are untouchable because of the place that they have chosen to be. They're just, you ought to just write yourself down a uh, safe space. You ought to just figure out what your safe space is. Okay, just say, hey, where's a place that I'm not tempted to do this at? You know, I've never been tempted to do that while I was sitting in church. I've never been tempted to do that while I was sharing my testimony. I've never been tempted to do that while I was. And then put yourself in the place where you can not yield to temptation. That's, that's just wisdom. And, then, you know, these little animals that don't seem to be much of anything are wise enough to be untouchable and to be invulnerable. Okay? All right? And then the millennials, the locusts, have no king. Yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. So there's no leader. They're just all together. And uh, they're pretty powerful all together, actually. Uh, yet <laughs> they, uh, they don't have anyone saying, you're going to go or you're going to stay or whatever. But the thing about them is, is that they don't have anybody telling them what to do, but they're all doing it. And they're all in a group and they're moving together. Have you, has anyone here ever seen any of those like 1920s, 1930s pictures of grasshoppers? Ever seen those? Uh, I, in Kansas, we had a dust bowl. What would that have been, 1920s? I don't remember very well. 30s. 20s, 20, well, there was in the 20s too. It was before the Depression. Yeah, A lot of people died. A lot of people got, um, I forget what, what the, they had lung issues and so forth. And, uh, my grandparents grew up in, in during the 30s one. Uh, but the... Um, they also had a lot of those those massive waves of grasshoppers coming through. Just massive waves of grasshoppers. Y'all have seen pictures of those? A couple of times in my life, it looked like that was going to happen. And we saw these massive green grasshoppers. It's like they all incubated at the same time. And, man, they were all born. And they, they literally, when they go through a landscape, they eat everything green. And they all they move like a wave. And you can actually hear it sounds like roaring. And uh, it's just a really terrible thing. Locusts are a mighty, mighty group. They don't have a king. They don't have someone giving them orders. What makes them do what they do? Well, they're self-will. Self-will. In other words, the evident what we see here is a group of individuals that band together uh, by discipline. In other words, they, they go out in bands. And one doesn't say, well, I'm the leader or I'm the leader or whatever. Nobody has to be the top dog. They just go. And uh, that's... That's uh, sort of like millennials. Uh, I've struggled with that generation finding leadership, just finding people that are willing to be the guy that says, okay, we're going to do this. No, it's like, well, let's all talk. Let's all consult together. Let's all. But they do collaborate. They're collaborative. And they get the job done. And the, the locust, you know, you'll never be afraid of a little locust, but if you see a cloud of locusts coming, you might as well forget about harvesting anything because they're going to wipe you out. They're powerful. They're small. Uh, they're not organized, but they're powerful when they're together. Uh, they're nothing alone. This is the homeless guy downtown, verse 28. <laughs> the spider taketh hold with her hands as it, and is in king's palaces. Uh, was it last month? the most expensive property that's ever been sold in Broward County, not property, in, but the most expensive home, uh, was that in Hillsboro for $42 million, 11 bedroom house. You need to get more than 11 bedrooms for $42 million, in my opinion. Now there are many houses in Broward County that are praised much higher 
than that one, but this is the one that's sold for that. Most of the time, if you have $42 million to spend on a house, you want to build your own. You don't want to buy somebody else's. So you, you they buy a few cheap houses and tear them down, right, and that sort of thing. But $42 million, and they're trying to figure out um, what the, the thing is worth. And here's the thing that cracks me out, up about the folks that have the expensive property. If you ever get a chance to do like a ride through the intercoastal and just look at uh, the boats and look at some of the homes in, in, uh, in the Tri-County area, Miami, Broward, Palm Beach County, I can't wrap my mind around the wealth. Just It's just like, you know, you, I realize that we have a uh, national debt, but those people don't seem to be sharing in the national debt. It seems like they could pay it off pretty easily, and I think Bernie's going to make them, maybe. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> not really. Uh, the, the, as a joke. Anytime I say Bernie, that's a joke. Okay, it's always a joke. All right, now. <laughs> so, uh, but what cracks me up about it is the homeless people sleeping on their doorstep. You paid $42 million to get there, and the homeless guy got there for free. <laughs> Going to the same beach. You know, I cruise the same intercoastal they do in their fancy boat. They, you know, they swerve to avoid my, you know, rattle trap boat. You know, it's like, it, it's just, you know, they're the same. The, these individuals to get in their palaces had to do a lot, but a spider just goes <coughs> and weaves a web and gets herself there. One of the things to realize is the rich and poor meet together. The Lord's the maker of them both. And there really isn't so much that separates any person, especially not when we have a God who is not a respecter of persons. And a spider doesn't look very impressive, but, boy, you'll find her everywhere. You know, you find her. She, she picks some prime real estate. Uh, she taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. And uh, you can get bit by a black widow there just as well as you could in a jungle. All right? First, uh, let's try to just, just go through verses 29, 30, and 31 really quickly because these are good examples as well. There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely in going or attractive in going. Uh, Anthony likes to watch lions eat things on uh, YouTube. We did that over Christmas vacation. We watched crocodiles and different animals eating other animals. But a lion which is strongest among beasts and turneth not away for any. So a lion strongest among beasts. If you're going down a pathway and a lion's going down a pathway, and you say, stand aside. If it doesn't want to, it will not. You know, a lion, they're just, they're, they're beautiful if, if you're not, you know, if you're not in the same place without a barrier between <laughs> you and them. Uh, a greyhound. Uh, well, let's go back to the lion. We, uh, we're starting to have, did you guys see that in Parkland last week there was a, uh, I guess they think it was a pet, puma. They're calling it a puma, but it might be a mountain lion was caught in somebody's backyard this last week. And uh, up at Jupiter, where Brother Al lives, they're, they're really getting in the farms and eating people's pets and so forth, the mountain lions are. And when I was growing up, they, they uh, had a secret um, wildlife program where they started to, trying to control the deer population by bringing in predators like wolves and lions. And so in Kansas, we started having these mountain lions. My grandma was walking uh, had, had out on the farm, and she, she just went around a shelter belt of trees went around the corner and there was, she says, a lion that, that was about three foot tall, just looking at her. And she saw it and decided not to go there anymore. And backed up my mom, I guess, or I guess one of the hunters on our farm saw a lion sitting on the hood of one of my dad's vans. And uh, they're just kind of frightening. They're, they're, just, they're very graceful, very confident, and they look you right in the eye and like, oh, if you want to be here and you feel safe, you just go right on ahead and they make you feel not safe and you're out of there. Uh, verse 31, a greyhound. A greyhound. Yeah, they're uh, amazing to watch a greyhound chase down a jackrabbit. And he goat also. You ever been out somewhere and seen a goat on top of something? You now, tame goats will get on top of anything. They'll get on your car. Anything they're not supposed to, they'll eat, they'll climb. You ever seen just like a mountain and a peak and then a goat <laughs> like on it? It's, it's pretty beautiful. And then you ever see them like start to 
like just running along cliffs. Like, how do you do that? Well, they're, they're pretty marvelous to see. They're pretty well, very well, and they're very comely and going. And then the Bible says, and a king against whom there is no rising up. And uh, this is, of course, would be the yea four. The fourth one would be the one that is the point of emphasis. And that's a king that has got his situation under control. He's got his kingdom under control. He's got his uh, things in order. You say, Pastor, good king or bad king? Well, the Scripture doesn't comment on that. It's just talking about a king who rules. A king who is a powerful, uh, effective ruler. You know, when, uh, when, authority, when authority is not effective, the, the people that are under authority get surly and out of sorts and uh, out of control. It's really true. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've worked with youth enough to know that you need to keep a certain amount of control in things and everything will go just fine, but you get out of control and things start to really escalate. And uh, some of you that are parents know that sometimes a kid just needs to be brought back into, brought right back into, uh, into fellowship. Maybe they're getting just a little on the edge and you think, okay, you know what, you're about to cross a line there and we're just going to have to rule and bring things into control. And you know, a family that's run that way is a, is a well-oiled machine. It it's, works well. Everybody gets along well. A church that works that way gets along well. And uh, a kingdom uh, does the very same thing. Well, what you say, Pastor, what's the application for this passage of Scripture this evening? Well, we saw three, uh, or we saw four things that are small and that are wise. And, you know, I think we can relate to being small and having a need for wisdom, can't we? I tell our church a lot of times, some folks will say, you know, Pastor, what I like about our church is that we're small. I say, we're small, but we're not proud of that. In other words, I think that uh, there are a lot of benefits to a church where everybody knows each other and is a close-knit, tight family where people love each other. Uh, but we're not trying to be small. It's not our goal. We're not saying, well, we don't want to grow. We don't want to reach anybody. Nothing like that. And actually, the fact of the matter, though, is that we uh, can be effective, can't we, as a church? You know, one of the reasons I love church planting so much is that I realize that a church planter reproduces itself at least every year church plant does. If you have 10 people that start a church, in a year's time that church will certainly have reached 10 people. But if you have a church of 1,000, they probably won't reach 1,000 people in a year. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, numerically they're more effective. And you know, uh, as sometimes we use size for an excuse, there are individuals that don't give because they think they don't have a lot. Well, you know, I don't have a lot. You know, you know, somebody that's, I hope somebody that's a millionaire you know, gives for that and does something. We you know the kind of people that can do the most are just a whole bunch of little people that don't have much. I found that folks that don't have much can do a whole lot by just being wise about what they do and uh, being sort of like the locusts when they get together and they, and they, uh, and they all advance together. They're, they go in bands. Or like the conies that know their weaknesses and protect themselves and so they're not vulnerable and they can't be wiped out or destroyed. And uh, the, the spider that, though she's just a lowly spider, yet she makes her web in a king's palace. And, uh, you know, we can be in the best of places, can't we? And we can accomplish the best or the greatest of things. And then, of course, those three things that go well, the lion, the greyhound, and the goat, but ultimately the king. And, you know, uh, the, there's no allusions here to a king and a pastor. In the, in the service tonight. It bothers me sometimes when uh, men try to get people uh, to, when, when I guess when a pastor is a cattle driver instead of a shepherd, would be the mindset where he, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the boss, I'm the, I'm the man of God, and so you have to, you know, do what I say or knuckle under or follow me. That sort of nonsense. No, but, but uh, as, as a church, we ought to, we ought to uh, have ourselves under control. We ought to go gracefully. We ought to do things well. Uh, it shouldn't be helter-skelter and random, and, and uh, it, things ought to be well-ruled. And uh, the Bible says that it's a really beautiful thing. It's a comely thing when there's a king against whom there's no rising up. Well, what does that mean? Well, nobody's trying to overthrow him. Why? Well, because 
either they're afraid to or because they don't want to. Well, if we get rid of him, we're going to get something worse. We've got a good king. You know, I think of King Solomon and Rehoboam. Do you remember that? The differences between those two guys? And that gives us our final illustration for that, uh, for this passage of Scripture here. I, I can imagine, you know, this, of course, was not a proverb written by King Solomon, but I, I would hope that Solomon would have heard this proverb or would have known it and would have wanted Rehoboam to know the very things. Remember what Rehoboam, what Rehoboam's counselors told him. The old men said, hey, your father was pretty pretty harsh. He was pretty pretty heavy on people. He taxed them. They were pretty great burdens that he laid on them. And because of who he was, he could do that. And the other king's counselor said, but you're not Solomon. You're not your dad. And so here's what we advise you. The young man said, no, you come out and you tell him this. And man, he lost ten of the twelve kingdoms. This couldn't keep. There was rising up against him. We ought to be wise, oughtn't we? Let me let me just finish with that by saying as well, we as believers ought to be wise enough not to ostracize. Wise enough not to ostracize. I've had this com conversation with several people recently. I'm extremely frustrated by the reality that the, the children of our nation are being indoctrinated and have been for the last more than 50 years are being indoctrinated uh, by a government socialist agenda. It bothers me that our kids are taught that there's no God. They're taught that, that God's not the Creator. And they're taught things that aren't so, that aren't true. They're taught things as facts. They're taught just abominations today. You have to exempt you. In the public school, you have to exempt your kids today from being taught to be homosexual, from being taught to be transgender. I'm not talking about talk, oh, this is what exists. No, this is, this is what you probably are. And being taught how to do, how to be those things, it's really frustrating to me. And sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, I just am thrilled with the size of our youth group in our church. On Sunday morning, we've been averaging 10, 12 teenagers. It's a good sized group for a small church, and so we've got a lot of teens, and we've got some of the best teens in the world in our church. I'm really thrilled about that. Uh, but when I when I uh, drive by the high schools in our county and just see thousands of kids that I just don't have access to, and I wish I could teach them. And I just think, man, they're all being taught by someone who doesn't love the Lord for the most part. Just, It's just sometimes just overwhelming. Just like, what can we do? And it just seems like too much. But then I realize, you know, it really has been uh, more than 60 years where there's been this really, really strong anti-God agenda in our, in our schools, in our nation. And yet everybody that's 60 years old is not a crazy, bonkers, you know, God-hating liberal. Why is that? Why is that? Well, there's hope, that's why. You know, there comes a certain point when a person's philosophy or worldview or the way they think is faced with actual reality. You can think a thing about families, but when you get to be a certain age and you're not married and uh, you don't have anyone that's committed to you in a marriage kind of way and you start thinking about dying that way or not having children with two parents and you start thinking about the world's philosophy of doing things, you realize, you know what, that may be the, cur the po politically correct way of living, but it just doesn't work. You know, you may think a certain way politically, but you get a certain age and you realize, but that just doesn't work. And all of a sudden, reality faces people. And you know what it really is, is God's just really merciful. And so my mindset toward people that are really, really polar opposites of me if I meet someone who's, in, who's a teacher in the public school system, I don't just look at him as a godless atheist that, uh, you know, isn't is the off-scouring of God's green earth. You know, I don't, you know what I do is I look at him as a person that God could change their worldview and their mindset, and they could be different. When I see a teenager who's 19 or 20 and they're going away from the Lord and they're in rebellion and, and they're not doing well, they're not doing right, I don't uh, see them as a person that, uh, you know what, you're always going to be what you are. You know, I see it. I just see people that could be that could be changed, that God can reach. And so we have to be careful as a believer not to ostracize. Not to put a final barrier between us and them and make it as though we hate you. We don't hate anybody, do we? Not against anybody. God isn't. No. God loves people. You know, this is a real help to me when I deal with bad service sometimes, some places. Boy, I've got a tongue on me. <laughs> I, I can think of things... And uh, the things that I think to say are clever, and actually they make me laugh when I think about them. But man, if I say them, they really cut someone up. 
or they say some awful things. They may be actual, they may be true, but they're not what should be said. They don't fit the Philippians requirement. And uh, the truth of the matter is that, you know, I have to be careful, even when I deal with someone, that I don't ostracize them, put them on, on the other side so that they can never hear the gospel. And we as believers need to be really careful about that as a church, as a body. We need to say, you know what, yeah, you know what, our city, you know, we don't have any commissioners that aren't homosexuals right now. We don't have any commissioners that aren't homosexuals in Oakland Park. As far as, I, or, or at least not run on a homosexual sympathetic platform. I think they're all homosexual. Or, on, or they ran on a platform of being, that was the platform they ran for. Um, it's a bad situation. Mayor of Fort Lauderdale is a, is a homosexual right now, and uh, this that's a we're in we're in quite a quite a mess as far as just the wickedness of those that we're surrounded by. Let me remind you that there's not a person in Broward County that the Holy Spirit of God cannot convince of sin and who cannot be turned. To receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's not a person in Broward County God doesn't love. Sorry. There's nobody that God can't save. And you and I don't know. We know that there are people who are wicked and they're living and they're breathing. God's given them breath. And yet I've seen God save so many people. How many of us this evening would say, you know what, but for the grace of God, I'd never be sitting in this place? <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not a church people. I, if you were to evaluate me, you'd say, that's a guy God had never saved. It's most, most believers, isn't it? And yet God, the gospel is so powerful. And you and I need to remember that be reminded about it. Father, we thank you so much for these examples that we've seen. And I pray that you would help us as a church to take uh, some of these principles of people that are weak and yet do things that, that uh, manifest incredible strength. We recognize that our strength is your spirit. We recognize that our strength is the Word of God. And we recognize as well, God, that you can do anything. And so I just pray that this would be a year when as we seek to be exactly what you want us to be, that we would preach the gospel effectively, courageously, and ultimately that we'd see people come to Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. All right, let's take some prayer requests this evening before we dismiss. If you need to slip out, I understand. If for sake of time, let's go ahead and take a minute. Yes, sir, Brother John. Um,